finish editing and go ahead. Can you hear me? Okay, so thank you a lot for the kind introduction and uh, thank you also for inviting me to deliver this talk at this online conference. So uh, the title of my talk, as Naomi said, is Magnetoplasmonic Nanostructures, a new route to achieve a broadband active control of light matter interactions. So uh, I come from a field that is not magnetism actually, so uh, I would like to give first an introduction about plasmons and in particular about uh, localized plasmons and then also a very brief uh, overview of uh, magnet optical effects in metals. Um, then I will focus uh, my attention on uh, uh, nanostructures that are not interacting uh, in between each other. Uh, so-called nanoantennas, and I would like to show you some uh, um, applications, in particular a nice application we developed in Nanogune a few years ago for single molecule detection. Um, then uh, I would also like to introduce um, the audience to what can happen if you have uh, um, interacting antennas. So uh, I will talk briefly also about collective effects um, then uh, I would also like to um, show some uh, um, recent results uh, beyond uh, standard approaches in magnetoplasmonics. In particular, uh, I will show you um, some results on hyperbolic metamaterials and uh, uh, magnetoplasmonic uh, driven by uh, dark plasmas. And at the end, I would also like to give some perspectives uh, about also the work I'm doing here uh, on structured light and uh, coherent spin photon interactions. So uh, let's start with the plasmons. So uh, just to give you an idea, um, plasmonics is a very powerful tool because as you might know, uh, if you think about uh, um, a microscope, you cannot resolve uh, um, objects that are smaller than half of the wavelength of the light you are using. So usually what you can do is to resolve objects that are like bacteria or mitochondria um, and the objects that are smaller like viruses, proteins, or even small molecules are not, you cannot resolve them with uh, optical, um, standard optical techniques. So plasmonics, what um, does is to actually squeeze light in uh, sub, uh, very deep sub-wavelength volume, so you can resolve actually these objects and uh, um, study uh, structural information or doing spectroscopy on very, very small objects. So um, plasmonics also enable a lot of applications uh, in, for instance, energy storage or photovoltaics in nanochemistry to, let's say, drive uh, uh, nanoscale chemical reactions, uh, as I showed you in the previous slide for biosensing, so to see molecules and how molecules interact in between each other, uh, but also in optoelectronics, so uh, in, in, in developing new technologies based on light and uh, optomechanics, so you can also uh, think to use light to trap objects and to control their the mechanical properties, um, spectroscopy, but also in, uh, in medicine. For instance, plasmonic nanoparticles are used to uh, do optoboosting imaging of tissues or try to uh, destroy uh, cancer cells in organs. So um, just to give you an idea what a, a plasmon is, uh, is just a collective oscillation of electronic charges in metallic materials. So if you apply a bias or an electric field, you have a displacement of the charges around the ions. So you create this oscillation that if you think about a, a periodic uh, electric field, this oscillation is jumping uh, back and forth in time. 
And this is a very simple concept. Uh, so you can have different families of plasmons. Uh, the one I showed you is the definition of a bulk plasmon. Then you can have the surface plasmons propagating at, this, at the interface between the metal and the electric. But today we focus on localized plasmon. So localized plasmon, usually uh, the typical spectral range uh, to observe them is the visible near infrared. So in between 400 nanometers and 1.8 microns. And the basic idea is very simple. Mm, let's consider a metallic sphere uh, made, for instance, of gold, uh, whose radius is mm, on, of the order of 100 of nanometers. So uh, let's say sub-wavelength. And now if you come with an external electromagnetic field, uh, linearly polarized, as in the case I'm showing you, you, have, uh, you start to have this collective oscillation of electrons in, inside the, the, the nanoparticles. And uh, usually what you excite uh, is a, a, di a dipole moment. So what I'm showing you on the right is the, just a near field uh, um, a picture of uh, how the, electro the electric field is behaving close to the particle. And, uh, and as you can see, you can induce a, a, an electric dipole that is driven by the external electromagnetic field and in the far field, you have the usual dipolar emission that you can find also in the typical antenna you have uh, on top of the roof of your house. So it's, the concept can be connected also with uh, the concept of antennas. So uh, it's very uh, easy to describe this type of uh, uh, phenomenon also using uh, uh, the, the physics one course in, in, in uh, university. So you can see the external electromagnetic field as a driving force and the electronic mass is driven by this force. So you can model this as an harmonic oscillation and uh, you can describe then the material uh, through a damping constant and the motion using the same uh, parameters that you have uh, in the harmonic oscillator. So usually what you have is that at a certain frequency or wavelength, you can excite uh, a resonance. So you have a jump of phase in, uh, um, of pi uh, through the excitation of this, of this resonance. And uh, the nice thing is that by, for instance, changing the dimension of your uh, sphere of your metallic particle, you can tune the position of the resonance, but you can tune it also by changing the refractive index surrounding the particle. And this is very important for biosensing applications. And finally, also you can choose different materials so you can change the damping uh, of the motion of the electrons inside your particles to tune also the, the, uh, the intensity and the, and, the, um, and the width of the resonance. In particular, if you consider uh, a noble metal like gold, you usually have a very intense and sharp uh, localized plasma resonance. If you, go um, if you consider magnetic materials that are, uh, possess more losses, let's say, uh, you have a, a decrease in intensity of the plasmon and also the damping is larger, so the full width of that maximum would be uh, larger as well. So, um, very simply, how we can see localized plasmon in our lab. So, let's consider a light source, so just the, the visible light you have in your office, you illuminate your uh, particles that can be in solution or on, on a transparent substrate and uh, your light is, again, linearly polarized. And uh, as I showed you before, when you shine light on, on your particles, you, have, you start to have this oscillation, this harmonic oscillation. And uh, the two phenomena that, in principle, in the visible and near infrared uh, um, that you can have is uh, that light is either absorbed by uh, the nanoparticle or scattered. So, uh, and but the quantity, uh, the physical quantity you measure in your lab is of course uh, uh, a transmission. Uh, so you can connect, um, you can extract from your transmission the so-called extinction that takes into account both processes. So both uh, scattering and uh, absorption. So this is, is the simple way you can see a plasmon uh, in, in your lab. Now, um, just, to give you a very, very short introduction on magneto-optical effects, because I think many of you already know about magneto-optics, but for the people who actually do not know too much, 
um, considered just a, a, a metallic thin film. And uh, you know that if you come with a linearly polarized light, either um, P or S, so transfer magnetic or transfer electric, call, call them as you wish, uh, the outcoming light usually uh, preserves the same polarization. If, of course, the thin film is uh, optically isotropic, then uh, if you now apply an external magnetic field, so you have uh, induced some uh, magnetization in, in, your, in, your, in your material, what happens to your light that, uh, that the light, either reflected or transmitted, uh, changes polarization. So you start to have an elliptical light, and also the axis of the original polarized light is rotated. And uh, today I would like to focus more on the reflected case uh, discovered by uh, John Kerr. Uh, the transmitted case was discovered by Faraday. So, um, and on two main uh, um, configurations. So, um, the, we have two configurations that we usually explore in our lab. One is the polar, can affect the other is the longitudinal. In both cases, you have a variation of your, of your outcome polarization. So again, your polarization of the outcoming light is uh, uh, rotated and also is no more linear, but is elliptical. So you can define two quantities, the so-called uh, uh, care uh, rotation angle and the ellipticity uh, care angle. Okay. So now, again, uh, let's consider our film. We come with a linearly polarized light. We have an, an external magnetic field that is static in this case that we apply to our sample. And um, together with our um, direct, let's say, displacement or dipolar uh, oscillation, uh, thanks to the spin orbit coupling, we have also a transverse in-plane uh, dipolar oscillation. So again, the, 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 the mutual, uh, phase relation between these two dipoles gives you uh, a, a, a reflected field that is elliptically polarized. You can model this very uh, simply if you consider the angle as the ratio of these two uh, dipoles. And uh, um, I would like to focus your attention on this factor that is called the uh, uh, Boyd constant. And uh, uh, this is a classical quantity that takes into account the spin orbit coupling effect you have in your magnetic material. So this is the simplest case you can have in polar configuration, for instance. But um, what we are interested here is that how we can make plasmonics and magneto-optics talk in particular. Uh, some people are focusing on how to control plasmons using uh, uh, magnetic fields. But today, I would like to focus your attention on how we can control uh, magneto-optical activity uh, using plasmons. So the main idea here, uh, the main concept that you should now focus on is that what happens when we pass from a magnetic bulk material or thin film to a nanostructured magnetic material. So we might expect similar effects. So now um, let's just consider uh, non-interacting nanoantennas. Uh, I would like to uh, first introduce you this uh, uh, first work that is actually a very nice work, uh, uh, I would say a pioneering work uh, in the field. A few years ago, uh, some colleagues in Nanogune uh, actually started to study uh, nickel uh, nanoantennas. So this is just a SEM image. So, uh, they characterized them uh, with this very simple uh, spectroscopy technique. They measured the extinction and they found out that there is a uh, a quite uh, uh, clear uh, plasmonic uh, resonance. That was surprising at the time because people thought that nickel was too lossy to possess actually uh, uh, plasmonic properties. There was a, um, also another group in Madrid, the Armelles, the Boyara, Antonio Garcia Martin, they were studying similar systems, but they were combining also uh, magnetic materials with uh, um, gold to increase the plasmonic properties. So this work was pretty nice because through the near field optical uh, microscopy technique developed by uh, Rainer Hindenburg in, in, in Anogune, uh, they were able to actually um, see in the near field that these antennas possess a strong bipolar uh, behavior. So you can see here in amplitude and phase that you can excite an electric dipole in this antenna. So this work was very important uh, in the field. Uh, so later on, what we uh, did uh, was to actually um, take 
uh, antennas uh, of different um, size. In particular, we change the diameter of these antennas. So you can see that by changing the diameter, as I showed you previously, you can tune the position of the plasmonic resonance. And of course, we are interested in the magnetoptical properties. So we explored their uh, magnetoptical uh, behavior in the polar configuration. So we focused on two main quantities again, the care rotation and the care uh, ellipticity. And what we found is that, as you can see, at the position where the resonance is excited, the ellipticity uh, vanishes and the rotation is maximum. And this is strongly dependent on the position of the localized plasma resonance. So we were interested in understanding what is happening up here. And as you can see, if you consider a thin nickel film of the same thickness as the antennas, you don't see any interesting future. You don't see any clear, uh, apart from this range, but here you don't see any clear um, uh, vanishing of the electricity or maxima of the rotation. So again, the plasma is really playing a role. So we developed a model. So we uh, consider our antenna. We have our incoming linearly polarized light. And since we are applying an external magnetic field, we use the magnetization inside the material. So we have this spin orbit coupling. And as I showed you before, you have a transfer dipolar oscillation induced by the spin orbit coupling. So again, we have two main uh, players in this. We have two dipoles, one that is directly excited by the external radiation and another one that is actually uh, induced by the spin orbit coupling. So um, our reflected light will be again elliptical. And uh, uh, you can see here now in the ratio between these two dipoles, it appears another quantity that is the uh, polarizability due to the nanostructurization of our antenna. So uh, the point here is that a, a nice way to understand the physics of these objects is not to focus on this quality, but instead of on the phase of this ratio. So instead of, um, if, you focus, if we focus on the phase, we have a sum of terms. So we have a term that is actually the term coming from the material itself, is the bulk term, is the usual uh, spin orbit coupling term I was talking at the beginning when I was showing you that you have this Q factor, the volt constant. So this is the, the, the contribution from the, uh, let's say, thin field. But then we have a, another contribution that is coming from the plasma. So we have an additional phase. And if, if we sum up these two contributions, we end up with the total phase of our uh, outcoming electromagnetic field. And if we focus now on the phase, and if, if you look at the experiment, we see that when the phase is actually pi half, we have no rotation. So our reflected light is just purely elliptical, and the axis of the, our polarization is not rotated compared to the original polarization axis. Then if we move uh, to a phase that is, in, that is in between zero and pi half, we have the usual effect. So we have an elliptical light. We have also a, a car rotation. And then here, that is a very interesting point where we have the maximum of our rotation and the vanishing point of the ellipticity. So when the phase is zero or pi, uh, we have a light, that, a reflected light that is actually uh, not elliptical, but is just linearly polarized, just rotated with respect to the original polarization axis. So the, the role of the plasmon is to um, make um, possible to tune spectrally the polarization uh, uh, by on demand uh, of our reflected light. And this is the full calculation, analytical calculation. You can see that we can match uh, nicely the uh, experiment. So this is a, a general concept. But now I want, I want you to focus more on the um, um, on the on the on the on the physics. So you have the direct excited dipole. You have, uh, but you see that uh, the response is depending more on the spin orbit dipole. And this is uh, we put this by uh, taking elliptical antenna. So when in the extinction we excite the short axis, we know that in the in the magnetic response we expect that the response is depending on the long axis. That is actually what we have uh, found. Uh, and we prove this for both polarization. So when you excite the long axis uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, 
in the optical measurement, in the magnet optical measurements, you have the vanishing ellipticity and the maximum of the rotation at the wavelength of the short axis. So we proved actually our uh, model in this way. Now, uh, just mm, very quickly, I want to give you uh, um, a very quick overview on how you can use these antennas for sensing application. Sensing uh, is quite simple as concept. You consider your antenna, and if you put molecules on top, you have a shift of your extinction peak. And this is how uh, plasmonic sensing uh, overall works. So we consider our antennas. Uh, so we uh, focus on the extinction peak, but also we uh, look at the magnet optical response. So in particular, at the vanishing point of the ellipticity or the inverse of this quantity. And by changing the uh, refractive index surrounding the, the particles, we can track uh, um, both the, the shift in the extinction and also in uh, the ellipticity vanishing point. This concept is general and was just a proof of concept to, uh, to show that uh, the shift we see uh, in the extinction corresponds exactly to the shift we see in the uh, ellipticity vanishing point. So we can use this approach to uh, finally uh, follow the variation uh, of the local refractive index. But the point is here that we want to prove single molecule capability. So uh, we have to go for surface sensitivity. So instead of changing the refractive index, what we have done was to change, was to deposit the material, in this case was polyamide 66, that is called also nylon. And uh, depositing using molecular layer deposition technique, we could control the number of layers on top of our antennas to extract some numbers to prove that we can achieve single molecule detection. So what we did was to deposit uh, uh, in different cycles uh, uh, nylon on top of our antennas, and uh, we could uh, so uh, make uh, through an FM also characterization, we can correlate uh, the number of cycles to the average thickness on top of the antennas. And then, of course, we followed, we tracked the uh, shift of the ellipse, ellipse, ellipticity vanishing point. And what we found at the end was that uh, roughly with very simple analysis, we found that we can track almost some um, materials of um, aptogram per nanoantenna. Uh, this means roughly 100 monomers per nanoantenna and a single molecule is made of hundreds of monomers. So this was a nice proof of concept to show you that these antennas can be used to do single molecule detection. It's a very long story. I don't want now to uh, go uh, in details uh, because there are, we studied many systems uh, along the years, but uh, one in particular system that is interesting is uh, um, made of uh, interacting antennas. Uh, the concept is actually very simple. Uh, just consider a, a, an ordered lattice or array of uh, uh, plasmonic antennas and what you, what you have is that uh, you can induce a coherent coupling between the far field emitted by this antenna. So again, the polarizability this time takes into account also this diffraction coupling that you have at a certain uh, wavelength that you can tune by changing either the period or the refractive index of your uh, surrounding. And the idea is that uh, compared to the isolated case, you can see that you have a strong uh, uh, variation of the response at the diffraction uh, wavelength. Uh, we, in particular, we focus on a system where we change the uh, anisotropy of the antennas. So we consider elliptical antennas. And it, in, as you can see, is that when you excite the short axis, you have a strong uh, far field interaction on the transfer direction. And the same happens uh, for the uh, long uh, uh, axis. So this idea is to strengthen or to modify strongly uh, in a narrow spectral region the uh, optical response. But then we, of course, are interested in the, in the magnet optical response. So what we did was actually to um, um, focus on uh, this type of arrays. We compared random nanostructures with uh, uh, ordered ones. And the, the quantity that is important here is what I call the optical anisotropy. So it's the difference between the two configurations. And you can see that if you consider uh, the, 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 the ordered array, you have a stronger uh, optical anisotropy. And the same happens for uh, the magnet optical response. In this case, again, we proved that uh, it's the uh, perpendicular direction responsible for the magnetic optical response. 
But again, if you consider the anisotropy of the magnetoptical response, so the difference between the red and the blue curve, you see that for the order of the array, we achieve a huge and broadband uh, um, um, control of the anisotropy compared to the random uh, case. So the case that I call non-interacting antennas. And then we can engineer this mechanism, for instance, to amplify uh, the anisotropy. So uh, in this case, we just vary the dimension of the long axis of the ellipses, and you can see that by increasing the aspect ratio, it can increase this uh, anisotropy uh, at, mm, until a certain point where you reach saturation. And at the same time, and this is the experimental proof that uh, of the extreme case that we can actually um, achieve this experimentally. And then, of course, you can also uh, change the other axis, the short axis. In this case, the interesting effect is that if you reduce the aspect ratio, so if you if you go uh, towards a disk-like system, you can reach a, a very narrow spectral uh, region where you suppress the anisotropy. So, and this is uh, thanks to the uh, collective interaction between these, um, in these antennas. So, uh, just to uh, go now uh, to show some more recent results, uh, I gave you a real, uh, uh, let's say, um, educational overview of, 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 of magnetoplasmonic nanostructures supporting localized plasmon. But uh, if you go beyond standard approaches, in recently we focused on two different uh, approaches. One is uh, an approach based on dark plasma. Uh, what are dark plasma? Just consider a plasmonic uh, nanostructure that has a ring shape. In this type of uh, nanostructures, you can excite uh, uh, both bright modes, so they, they can couple very easily with external electromagnetic field, like this uh, uh, bonding and anti-bonding modes. But then you have also these two intermediate modes that are dark modes. And you, as you can see, if you, if you, if you shine the polarized light on a ring, you can excite just the bonding and anti-bonding modes that are actually the so-called bright modes. You don't have signature of these uh, dark modes. Of course, if you consider an unrealistic uh, uh, polarization and experimental uh, condition, so you break the symmetry somewhat locally in the near field, you can also excite this uh, dark uh, uh, plasmons, these uh, uh, subradiant modes, but this is unrealistic. So the way to actually uh, activate these dark modes is to uh, break the uh, geometrical symmetry of the system, for instance, by a non concentric geometry. So in this work led by uh, Alberto Lopez Ortega and Paolo Vavasoli, uh, uh, we show that actually uh, if you put a nickel disc uh, in, the, in the ring displaced from the center, you can actually excite uh, a mode at 1.5 electron volt, which is roughly 800 nanometers, that is actually the dark mode that is forbidden by symmetry, but if you break geometrically the symmetry, you can have this mode. But here, the take-home message is very important, because uh, here what we uh, showed is that at that specific uh, wavelength, the magneto-optical response is one order of magnitude larger than the one you can achieve with uh, simple, uh, the excitation of a simple bipolar mode. And this was a fundamental limitation before, because usually people uh, rely on the excitation of uh, localized plasmon based on uh, uh, dipolar oscillations, okay? Here, with the use of a dark plasmon, or in, well, more specifically of an hybrid mode, we, uh, the main idea is that um, here, again, you have the ratio between the magneto-optical induced dipole and the optical induced dipole, so the uh, reflected light is elliptically polarized, but you have this strong contribution from the uh, optically excited uh, dipole. So you have, a sub, uh, let's say, you have an enhancement of the magnetic optical effects, but at the, at the same time, what you have is also a, a, a kind of suppression, okay? So you can uh, gain one order of magnitude compared to the thin film, but yet it is not good for applications. With this approach, so exciting this hybrid mode, that is a sub mode, we can actually reduce uh, the denominator here, and we can also enhance so the effect of the magnet optical induced dipole. So this was an approach, uh, let's say, beyond standard uh, configurations. And another nice, uh, um, uh, interesting um, topic that we are now working on, uh, in, in this case in particular, with, in collaboration with uh, the group of Francesco Pinaider in Pisa, is the uh, hyperbolic metamaterials 
So um, hyperbolic metamaterials, the concept is very simple. I don't want to go into details, but if you consider a normal material like metal or dielectric, you can have, you have usually an elliptical uh, dispersion if you consider the relation energy and momentum. Okay, so you have a limited set of k vector that you can uh, couple with uh, your electromagnetic radiation. Uh, so in case of dielectric, these are uh, the, the dielectric constant is positive. In case of metal, is is negative. But the point is, with hyperbolic metamaterials, what you can do is that to, um, you have an infinite set of k vectors. So you have you can excite a lot of modes, and in particular, if you consider nanostructures like these two types of uh, artificial hyperbolic metamaterials, you can have uh, a, large a large number of density of states, uh, optical density of states. In particular, we focus on this system that is a multi-layer of dielectric and, and noble metal uh, material. So you can see that uh, in, this, in this case, if we just do a very simple effective medium, um, calculation, we have a region where the system behaves like uh, uh, a metal in the plane and like an insulator out of plane. So we can create uh, strongly optical anisotropic materials by just uh, uh, making a multilayered structure. So this is the basic concept. The, basic concept. the point is here also uh, that uh, in plasmonic uh, nanostructures like uh, uh, gold uh, uh, nanorods or nanoparticle, you have also um, a strong overlap between scattering and absorption processes. And you can also tune uh, the ratio between the two processes, but they happen uh, at the same uh, when energy. So the point is uh, here is that uh, scattering and absorption are really overlapped. Uh, so uh, with our approach using hyperbolic nanostructures, uh, uh, we can actually, uh, if, we, if we start from a plasmonic nanoantenna, so we have an overlap between absorption and scattering, but if we cut this antenna and make it in this, uh, let's say, configuration, so we can build up uh, nanostructure, multi-layer nanostructures, we can actually uh, separate the scattering and absorption channels. Uh, we, we put this first, so we uh, fabricate these uh, antennas, we measure the transmission, uh, you can tune the position of the absorption and scattering peaks by just changing the dielectric you use. Uh, if you increase the refractive index, if you pass from silica to titania, you can see that you can increase the separation between these two channels. And we also prove experimentally using a, a, an, integration, an integrating sphere that you can actually have this uh, large uh, scattering or absorption contribution. So based on this, we then uh, tried to uh, measure the magnetoplasmonic uh, properties of these uh, uh, particles, in, in particular, the uh, circular uh, dichroism. Okay, so uh, I don't want now to uh, go too much into the details because also the time is running. The point is here that the main difference uh, in between a plasmonic antenna and a hyperbolic antenna is that you have a, a, a larger broadband control on the uh, polarization selectivity. Uh, because in this case, you can come with either uh, uh, right hand or left hand or right slides, and you can, uh, depending on the wavelength, you can select uh, one of the two, um, one of the two um, um, polarization. Okay, so uh, very simple concept. Uh, I, again, I don't want to go to, into the details um, too much. So uh, what we showed uh, briefly is that uh, exactly at the, at the scattering and absorption peaks, we have a strong variation of the magnetic circular dichroism. Uh, we prove this uh, with an effective medium approximation, so we can state that our particles are really hyperbolic. And also we did some near field calculation to uh, see that actually the, um, the, the main effect comes from the uh, in-plane currents uh, this is just the, the, the magnetic circular dichroic response in the near field where we plot the, the current induced by the external magnetic field. So uh, we could understand the physics, and uh, now this, this work is actually under review. Then, just to conclude, I want to give you some perspectives. Uh, one comes from the structure of light. Uh, again, uh, if, if you consider a circularly polarized light, here what you have is that. Uh, you can have uh, a spin, so right or left polarized, but you can have also an orbital angular momentum of light. So you have uh, 
uh, an helical, uh, let's say, shape of your uh, incoming uh, or outcoming electromagnetic field. Uh, using plasmonics, what you can do is to, uh, to the total angular momentum, you can add an additional uh, uh, angular momentum that is due to the, to the structure of your plasmonic uh, uh, geometry. And this is very important because you can, uh, with, this, with, with this approach, the main, uh, um, the main outcome is, is that you can, uh, depending on the uh, polarization, on the incoming polarization, you can have a different total angular momentum uh, uh, coming out from the, um, from your uh, structure, okay? And in particular, you can selectively um, uh, absorb uh, uh, or let pass uh, a particular uh, um, uh, circular polarized uh, configuration. So uh, with magnetoplasmonics, you can just do this. Briefly, uh, uh, I am at the end of the talk, so I have to sorry to, 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 to run. Uh, the point here is that you can use uh, magnet, external magnetic field to tune either the transmittance or the polarization selectivity uh, of the incoming polarization. And uh, uh, just to conclude, uh, now uh, one thing that we are exploring here in Luxembourg is that uh, uh, we are studying a lot uh, parallel uh, in the regime because it's a regime where you can actually couple uh, probably uh, magnets and uh, plasmonic modes. Uh, Parallels is also a very hot topic right now in magnetism uh, because it's considered the, the, speed, uh, the, the, the speed limit of magnetism. And uh, uh, in, in the past year, you can see that the topic is becoming really hot because people are trying to uh, drive coherently uh, uh, spin dynamics at the patterns or even using plasmons to drive uh, magnetization dynamics. So uh, the first thing we need to do here is to uh, develop nanostructures that work in this regime. And uh, the point is we develop this uh, uh, germanium antennas. Uh, so here the main point is that uh, we can, in the time domain, we can uh, measure the uh, time resolve response of this antenna, so we can characterize in amplitude and phase our plasmonic resonances. I'm finished, Naomi, don't worry. Uh, so uh, the point is, uh, now here we are developing tools to connect, uh, uh, um, um, to, to, to understand what is the amplitude and phase in, in plasmonic nanostructures and couple them with magnetic materials. So we can study coherent effects, so we can uh, really uh, understand how is the phase relation between uh, optical excitation and in the future also magnetic excitation, because we have access to, the, to this information. So I want to acknowledge all the collaborators working on the uh, results I presented today, in particular, uh, Paolo and uh, Daniele. Uh, if you want to know more, these are very recent reviews uh, on the topic. Uh, by some colleagues and from us. And uh, there is also a special issue uh, in magnetophotonics uh, led by David Bossini and myself for applied sciences. And for your knowledge, we have also PhD positions open in our group. And thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for this very, very nice overview and very beautiful pictures. Um, very very nice to see all the different directions and how you can use uh, nanoparticles and plasmonics. Um, I think we have time for one or two questions. Um, is there one from the audience? So if you want um, I, a question, please. Hmm? I don't see, uh, just, I sh stop, okay. <laughs> uh, yes, I mean, I mean, uh, People are talking or they are writing the questions in the chat? Um, so I, I think in principle they can talk. Um, I think I have to un allow them to unmute. Uh, I'm not sure. Um, now I'm, ah, I, one question then from my side. Um, when you showed the, um, uh, the molecule sensing. Yes. Um, in principle, you were using the magneto optics as a, tool for, for sensing in a way, right? Because yes. you were not sensing the magnetic particles. It was more like to be used as a 
No, no, yes. In, in that case, we were sensing through the magnet optical effect, we were sensing the presence of the molecule. So we were exploiting the presence of the plasmon to sense the local variation of the refractive index due to the presence of the molecule. Okay. So, no, I just wanted to clarify. It's a very neat idea. Um, okay. Thank you very much for your talk. I actually have many more questions. I think we should go on um, with the next speaker. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, and our next uh, presentation is given by Alejandro Gomez Roca. It's also an advisor talk. Uh, he's from the Catalan Institute of Nanoscience, Nanotechnology in Barcelona. And he will give us um, uh, a presentation about magnetoplasmonic nanodomes as a novel structure for biomedical applications. Speaking with the plasma. Okay, so first of all, let me share the screen. Ah, okay, so I have to wait. Ah. Should yeah. Be, should be, uh, can you share the screen? Let me, no, I have, I need your permission. Uh, uh, David, can you, can you give the permission? Is this the, no? Huh. We're done. Uh, okay, so now, yes. Share. Okay. Uh, oh, okay. Um, Good. Yes. So, uh, tell me, tell me, tell me. Okay. So, okay. So, uh, well, before starting, I would like to thank the, the organizers, uh, especially Naomi Leo and also the chairman David. Uh, well, first of all, to give us the chance uh, for the, to give an invited talk uh, here in this Moni Colloquia. And second, because uh, I guess that you have done a tremendous uh, effort to reorganize all the conference in, a, well, in a state of a presidential. Uh, now it's in an online format and, well, instead of cancel, cancel it. So, well, uh, congratulations. And I hope that the, uh, the conference has been uh, a success. So now let's start with my, with my presentation. So as Naomi said, the title is uh, Magnetoplasmonic Nanodomes as a novel structure for biomedical applications. And as you can see here by the huge number of authors, this work is the result of a collaboration between different groups from the UAV Sphere, the ICN2 and the UAB University, and also the SIG Nanogone Institute based in San Sebastian. So here you can see in this figure almost all the, um, all the, almost all the applications of the nanoparticles. You can see there are big areas like, for example, energy. You can see also uh, the impact that it has on, on electronics in the environmental applications, food and agriculture. And also there is a big area that corresponds to the applications of particles in biomedicine. So why we are able to use nanoparticles in biomedical, in biomedicine? So first of all, because of their nanometric size, which allows an easy interactions with the biological matter. So in normal conditions, we use nanostructures between five and 20 nanometers which are from more or less from the same size range than uh, biomolecules such as glucose, proteins, DNA, and virus, and also smaller than, than cells. So this, uh, the application in biomedicine had a, well, uh, let's say that uh, there are five different uh, uh, topics that, uh, well, it has a lot of interest uh, for researchers which, uh, for example, are the, the toxicity of these particles inside the, the body, how we can sense with the nanoparticles uh, several analytes or metabolites inside also the body, also the nanochemistry, and how we are able to fabricate uh, our nanoparticles for biomedical applications, uh, also, and also used for the, for the treatment to cure uh, several diseases, and also for, the, uh, for imaging and how the particles could be imaged inside the body to detect uh, diseases. So uh, biomedical applications could be split it into two different uh, uh, well, types, which are diagnosis, which includes 
biosensing and bioimaging, and also therapy, which includes uh, drug or gene delivery, and also hyperthermia. So based on the physical properties of the particles, we have this uh, local hyperthermia, which is based on the slight increase um, in temperature of the surroundings where the particles are. So it means that under the irradiation or under the stimulus of a laser or radio frequency, uh, the particles are able to dissipate the heat. They can be used in combination with uh, conventional radio or chemotherapy, increasing temperatures uh, to the uh, cancerous cells up to 41 or 45 degrees, or also you can heat above 45 degrees, causing a cell destruction uh, in a process which is called uh, thermoablation. So there are two main types of uh, hyperthermia. The first one uh, deals with the magnetic uh, hyperthermia. So uh, you can use uh, superparamagnetic or well a bit ferromagnetic iron oxide nanoparticles of 10, 15, and now it has been published uh, particles of around 20 nanometers that under the presence of alternate magnetic fields of around 100 to up to 500 of kilohertz, they are able to dissipate uh, heat under different mechanisms. These mechanisms, as you can see here, AC losses or stresses heating or steering, it de they depend on the uh, properties of the particles, such as the size, the effective anisotropy, crystallinity, and well, however, this uh, technique presents several limitations like the, uh, that you need a high particle concentration inside the, the body and close to the cells that you want to, to treat. And also the fact that they are inside the body, the manipulation is a bit uh, weak. There is also a main hyperthermia, which is called photothermia, which uh, uses uh, near infrared light. So, uh, particles that are able to absorb energy of the near infrared lights, like for example, the best example are uh, gold nanoparticles, they are able also to dissipate uh, heat. So uh, we are able uh, to use them for the biomedical applications because there are two, uh, two energy regions which are called biological uh, windows, which are located at around 800 and 1,100 nanometers, where the particles could absorb, but biomolecules inside the body and also water do not absorb so much. That's very important because if we radiate, for example, with a laser of 600 nanometers, apart from the particles, we could hit also uh, well, the skin and fat and could be undesirable. So thanks to the well uh, chemistry, nanochemistry engineer, we are able to tune the surface plasmon to response on this uh, biological windows. So we are able to tune, for example, in elongated uh, particles, the aspect ratio, or as you can see here, we are also able to tune the geometry in order to tune the surface plasmon one. However, it also has a limitation which that the particles are passive delivery and also the penetration is not so high. So which is the goal, uh, the goal of, our, of our work here? So we would like to propose a magnetic enhanced photothermal therapy where we intend to active delivery the particles to the action site by perform a magnetic guidance of the optical nanoheaters. And also at the same time, we aim to real time monitor and control the therapeutic action. So we also propose a nanothermometry uh, concept. So this is the nanostructure that we propose for this, uh, for this therapy. This is what we call nanodomes, which are, as you can see here in the nanostructure, they are composed of a polyestyrene uh, or silicone sphere of at around 100 nanometers, and they are partially covered by a sphere of, uh, uh, of gold and also of iron. So in the case of gold, the fact that uh, this gold has a localized surface plasma, it, it confers a lo uh, local optical heating properties. Also gold is a high atomic uh, number so, uh, element, so uh, gold is able to be imaged by X-ray computed tomography. And thanks to gold chemistry, we are able to biofunctionalize the, the nanodomes by, uh, with proteins. And also the fact that we have a magnetic domain that in, in, this, in our case uh, is iron or, or cobalt, 
Well, uh, the particles, it confers a high magnetization, so we are able to uh, strongly manipulate the, the particles by uh, the action of a magnetic field. And also, these uh, nanodones could be imaged by nuclear magnetic resonance imaging. So, in order to create, uh, to fabricate these magnetoplasmonic uh, nanodones, the fabrication process is composed of four different steps. The first one is uh, we form an electrostatic self-assembly in a silicon wafer of 100 polyestyrene spheres. In a second step, uh, by electron beam physical vapor deposition, we are able to deposit first iron and then gold. Also, in a third step, we are able to functionalize with polyelectrolyze the, the nanodos. We are we also be able, we are allowed to, to functionalize with DNA, also lipids. And finally, in the last step, we transfer them to, to water by ultrasonication. So this process presents several advantages, such as the fabric that uh, we fabricate the nanodomes in, in Baker, so we don't need the use of toxic organic solvents. Also, uh, the particles could be directly functionalized in, in the wafer and be directly dispersing water-based solution. So uh, also thanks to the fact that they are coated by a polyelectrolyte, it confers a high colloidal stability. And also that the fact that we are able to control the thickness of iron and gold, uh, we are able to tune the magnetic and optical properties. So in this work, we were able to fabricate nanodomes keeping an overall thickness of 40 nanometers, but with different aspect ratios of iron and, and gold. So these are the structural properties, as you can see in these SCN images. The, the polystyrene spheres or, could form a electrostatic self-assembly on the uh, silicon wafer. And thanks to the TEM and also IL select, uh, spectroscopy, you can see by TEM that uh, the nanodons are partially covered by, by metals. And also by eels, you can see that we successfully cover the particles by iron and, and gold. So by this process, we were able to fabricate at around 600 milligrams of uh, nanodons in a four inches wafer, but this process could be scalable. In order to uh, gain more cell internalization inside the, the cells, we biofunctionalize or nanodons with a protein, which is called transferrin, uh, taking advantage of the uh, gold chemistry and the thiol groups or amine groups of the, of the proteins. So you can see here by infrared spectroscopy that uh, the particles with proteins possess a higher intensity in the band of around 1,600, which corresponds to NH uh, groups. So this uh, immobilization of proteins in the surface was done in just uh, one hour, so it was a fast process. So this is here uh, results of the cell internalization. We tried to mimic the structure by using polyacene and a fluorescence dye. And you can see by fluorescence imaging, by these red dots here, which are the nanodomes, how the particles were successfully internalized in cells. And also, in order to quantify the nanodome internalization, we performed a flow cytometry, and we have observed that uh, the use of uh, transferring allows a four times increase in internalization efficiency compared to the bare nanodomes. Regarding the magnetic properties, uh, when the thickness of uh, the iron thickness is very small, for five and ten nanometers, particles behave as single domain particles. So, in the case of five nanometers, you can see that the stereosis loop is closed, so they behave more or less as a, a superparamagnetic nanoparticles. However, in the case of 10 nanometers, the stereosis loops is open, so the particles are, uh, are blocked. However, above the 10 nanometers, the magnetic behavior changes. And instead of presenting these single domain particles, you can see that they present this vortex structure uh, uh, behavior. This vortex structure is characterized by a circular arrangement on the implant magnetization. And also, you can see here, the remanence is close to zero, even though they have a large, uh, a large size. Regarding the colloidal properties, at pH 7, they have a negative uh, charge of uh, minus 20 millivolts. And the size in solution is 113 nanometers. 
So the particles are isolated in solution. That's very, that's very important. So in general, uh, well, the presence of high colloidal stability and thanks to the uh, big uh, magnetic domain, they can be strongly manipulated. So regarding the optical properties, you can see how the iron thickness affects the, the extinction uh, spectra, the extinction coefficient uh, behavior, because the surface plan of man located at 800 and also 600, well, uh, red shifts and also gets uh, attenuated and also becomes broader with the iron thickness. So we also perform local heating uh, experiments. This is the, the simple setup that we use, a laser. We also measure the, uh, the temperature by infrared thermometry using a power uh, modulating intensity with a power meter. And what we have observed, interestingly, is that the increasing temperature, well, of course, increases with the nanodons concentration and also is independent of the iron gold uh, ratio. So in order to understand the results, we perform some finite uh, different time domain uh, analysis. And well, first of all, says that uh, we measure extinction, which is the sum of absorption and scattering. And in heating properties, increasing temperature, are due to the absorption properties that it seems that has not been very attenuated due to the, to the presence of, of iron. So, uh, well, here in this, uh, in this case, you can see that, well, only the nodes uh, that are longitudinally aligned contributes to the local optical heating. And when the thickness of iron increases, well, of course, there is a decrease in absorption in the longitudinal uh, mode. So the optical isotropy is reduced. But by the other side, there is an increase in the optical absorption on the transversal so let's say that the transversal mode could compensate also the longitudinal uh, one. So uh, it says that uh, the iron has a weak influence in the heating efficiency. However, the iron, as we can see in the next slides, uh, leads to several advantages. The first advantage is that we are able, of course, to manipulate the, um, the nanodomes. And we also uh, perform some trapping efficiency analysis of the nanodomes by a magnet. So we use uh, nanodons of different iron thickness. And we have observed that, the, uh, well, that the, how the time of trap time change from uh, 67 minutes for the nanodons with uh, five nanometers iron up to two minutes for the nanodons with 30 nanometers in on thickness. So, uh, well, we are able to locally amplify the uh, therapeutic uh, temperature by, uh, let's say, putting more particles in the illuminated uh, region. So, for example, if we put particles and they are attracted up out of the optical path, so here you can see that uh, when we switch on the laser, of course, you register an increase in temperature. But if you uh, trap the particles outside the optical path, the temperature uh, decreases. However, if you trap the particles on the optical uh, path, you can see that apart from the slight increase of the uh, caused by the near infrared laser, you also obtain a huge increase in temperature uh, in temperature due to the magnetic uh, action. In order to compare uh, our optical prop uh, heating properties with the state of the art of the plasmonic uh, nanoparticles, uh, well, mm, up to our knowledge, the particles that are more efficient on, on heater are gold nanorods. So we can see that uh, our nanodons that are with a composition of 20 in iron and 20 in, in gold uh, has a similar efficiency that the, that these gold nanorods, but especially when they are uh, manipulated by a magnetic field and put the particles in the, in the optical path. So this is an example of how the particles could be imaged. So they have a T2 contrast uh, uh, imaging properties. And also, they can be imaged by X-ray computed uh, tomography. And also, using fluorescence polystyrene bits instead of the normal ones, uh, we were able to uh, well see the particles, image the particles by confocal microscopy. 
So we also perform in vivo bio distribution in, in mice. We inject the particles, as you can see here in the, in the liver, they present a normal gray color. But once we inject the, the particles, and thanks well, uh, to the, the darkened properties, you can see that the liver gets uh, darker. Here you can see very clearly. However, with the, when the time goes, uh, the particles are eliminated and if they recover, they contrast the uh, original uh, features. So regarding the experiments with the cells, we also perform in vitro experiments with HeLa cancer uh, cells and, and nanodomes with a composition of 20, 20 in iron and, and gold. We are able to incubate the uh, cells uh, with the particles uh, during three hours and we also perform in different uh, conditions such as uh, magnetic moments and also the action of an infrared laser. So you can see here, we carry out a cell viability studies. And as you can see, when we are able to, um, to induce magnetic, uh, well, optical heating in the presence of a magnetic field, either at 10 micrograms per milliliter or 100 mi micrograms, we were able to uh, cause a near a 100% uh, percent of mortality by the cell. So this uh, proves the uh, effectiveness of the uh, of uh, the treatment that we propose. So this is the SEM pictures of these cells before the treatment, as you can see uh, here. And you can see that after the treatment, you can see how the state of the cell changed, but at least the membrane has not been disrupted. However, when we increase the concentration of the nanodose, we cause more, more heating, and you can see that the cells were completely destroyed. So the membranes could not support, let's say, for the, the heating increase, and they uh, were completely uh, destroyed. So one can think that, uh, well, which is the actual temperature of the liquid surrounding the, the particles in order to fine tune in the treatment, because you can measure the temperature by an optical uh, fiber or by infrared thermometry, but you measure of the concentration, but you don't have no clue about the, con the temperature surrounding the, uh, surrounding the cells. So here we propose a simultaneous uh, nano thermometry uh, system, which is based on the optical tracking of the uh, nanodome uh, rotation. So again, this is the nanodome structure that we propose. Instead of having two layers of iron and, and gold, here we present a, a multi-layer system composed of cobalt and gold of one nanometer and six nanometer um, alternating themselves and also ending with a layer of five nanometers in gold. Regarding the structural properties, you can see that again, we were able to partially cover the, the nanodos with these metals. Uh, by ADX uh, mapping, you can see that we success in uh, doing this multi-layer system on the, uh, on the nanodomes. So this system, thanks to the, to the coupling of cobalt and gold, they will have, uh, and also thanks to the geometry, it will have a high magnetic and optical anisotrometries that we will confer a strong magnetochromic effects. So this magnetochromic effect means that uh, the color of the colloidal suspension on them, uh, will change under the action of a magnetic uh, induction uh, field. So as you can see here, under the static uh, magnetic field, but two different configurations, perpendicular with the polarization light and in parallel, you can see that how the spectra of the particles, uh, the transmission, uh, transmission transmittance completely change if it's in perpendicular or in parallel mode. This is the setup that we used, which is a low cost and, and very simple. We use a single polarized laser, laser beam and just with a coil and a photodiode to register the, the change in transmitters with the with the wavelength. And also you can see how the spectra is sensible with the magnetic uh, with the magnetic field. So instead of using a, if instead of using a static magnetic field, we use a dynamic one, an alternate ro rotate magnetic uh, field, we are able to uh, modulate the intensity. And as you can see here, how the, uh, well, we change the, the magnetic field and also the, the transmittance of the, of the particles. 
And as you can see, that we also perform the, with the photo that, uh, that registered the information, the analysis by Fourier. Uh, so we have seen that uh, the maximum sensitivity of the nanodomes uh, was uh, well was observed at around 700 Hertz, and also the phase lag. That uh, well, if there is a delay, is due to the viscosity on the of the solution where the particles are. So as I said, we are able with this uh, system to detect the viscosity around the particles. So we prepared different systems mixing water and grease oil, which is more mix, uh, viscous than water. And you can see by the phase lag and the frequency that how the uh, our system is sensible to the increase is uh, in viscosity. So when the viscosity increases, you can see how that at the, at the same frequency well, the phase lag uh, also in increases. And also, we also check the limit of detection of the of this nanothermometry concept, and it's around uh, 10 to the minus 3 millipascals per, per second. So in order to detect the temperature variations of the, the particles, uh, we correlate the viscosity decrease with the increase in, in temperature because, uh, well, because of the relation of the Brownian uh, motion. As you can see, that we cause a heating, uh, we heat our systems with a Peltier uh, cell, and we have observed that uh, increasing the temperature and lowering the viscosity, we decrease the uh, phase lag of uh, well of our nanodomes. Moreover, we also observe that uh, we have a limit a detection limit in temperature of around uh, 0 0.05 uh, degrees. So uh, here you can see that uh, in comparison with uh, a conventional with the method that we were using to uh, to measure the temperature. Here we compare the increase in temperature with the nano well detection of temperature with the nanodomes in comparison with the infrared thermometer. And as you can see, uh, when we were heating with the laser, especially here, that. Uh, our system with the nanothermometry system is more sensible to the temperature variation. So it reacts earlier than the, than the nanodomes and also it can register a uh, higher increase in temperature inside the, the cells. And here you can see, in order to check the, uh, the properties on the reaction time, when we use a laser a pulse laser power, how our nanodomes are able to react with the, with the temperature very fast. However, the infrared thermometer, as you can see here, takes a lot of time and not, are not as, is, is not as sensible as the nanodomes registering the increase in temperature surrounding the, the nanodomes. So once we check the, the theory and we evaluate our nanothermometry system, we try to, let's say, a test in a biological media. So we test in a cell medium with monocytes. Well, this medium, I have to tell you, that presents a high optical scattering. So the transmitted light could be reduced uh, 20 times. However, we have observed the difference of uh, transmittance also and proper uh, temperature registration between the cell medium and the monocytes. We were able to register the, the difference in, in temperature. And also, as you can see here, when we use the two different types of machine the temperature, or nanodomes and the infrared thermometer, how also the um, or nanodomes were more sensible than the infrared thermometer to detect the variation in temperature. That also, uh, even the system is very complex, we were able to detect the temperature with a detection limit of 0 0.1 degrees. So the conclusions of this talk is that uh, regarding the, the first part is that the iron gold nanodomes are able to be used to, for controlling uh, photothermal therapies. They are strong nanomagnets and also present uh, high properties as nanoheaters. They could be imaged by different uh, techniques like NMR computer tomography and fluorescence imaging. And also they, are, they present a high efficiency uh, in photothermal therapy using a, a magnetic field, so a magnetic manipulation. So regarding the use of the cobalt uh, gold nanodons for nanoheater uh, thermometers, this system presents a high magnetic and optical anisotropies. 
Also, uh, this system also is able to detect the viscosity and the variations in temperature with high sensitivity. And also, they are able to simultaneously uh, detect the well optical heat and also detect the difference in temperature, even in complex systems like cell dispersion. And finally, I would like to thank the our sponsors from the Spanish Ministry of Science, the United of Catalonia, our institute, and also the Ramon Areces Foundation, and of course the uh, my group led by Professor Giuseppe Nove. So uh, again, thanks for for your attention. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, really like the, the use in, in bio and, and ex fighting against cancer. Um, <laughs> I do have questions, but I want to uh, ask the audience first if, if somebody has a question. Alejandro? Yeah. Um, please indicate in the chat if you want to have a question. We have um, time. Um, or you can write down your question. Um, maybe I start then with one and give the rest of the audience time to think of their question. Mm -hmm. um, when you, when you um, went to the temperature detection, you went mm -hmm. from a double layer system to a multi-layer system. And maybe yeah. I missed um, the argument for doing so. What are the advantages and what are the disadvantages? Well, uh, Mm, I guess that, uh, well, I have to say that I was not responsible to design the system, but if I don't remember, but maybe because it presents higher uh, optical anisotropy and, and magnetic than the, than the, that the ones that presents iron and, and gold. Uh, the disadvantage is true of using the cobalt. I mean, the advantage is that uh, for the higher optical, it could be the higher optical anisotropy, but the disadvantage maybe for using in, in biomedical applications is that cobalt could be uh, toxic at a certain concentration, especially if it gets oxidized inside the, the body. So I think in this case, more studies regarding cytotoxicity uh, should be carried out. Okay, and then, then I have um, uh, a question regarding, so, so um, because biocompatibility is, is very important, I think there is always a bit of a doubt with the magnetic materials that they are well encapsulated. Uh, what is it about the thyro, thyro, thyro something beads? Are they kind of, um, because I don't know, I mean, it's a stupid question. No, no, no. Can you uh, ask again? Because I couldn't hear you ah, okay, properly. Okay, apologies. Um, so, regarding the biocompatibility, um, uh, how is it for the for the beads? <laughs> okay. So the beads, uh, well, it's a very well known uh, system uh, regarding that it has been studied the cytotoxicity um, for a long, long time, and well, in fact, it's it's approved by the Food and Drug uh, Administration. So you can think that because of the, its its size, they could not be very good for the for the cells, no. But uh, thanks that I think that uh, potentially is not a harmful material. I mean, it's very biocompatible. Uh, because of that, they could be used for for biomedicine. In fact, also there are uh, beads, uh, composites formed by beads, uh, by polymeric beads, like for example, polyestylene or polyethylene glycol, that also possess uh, has, uh, magnetic nanoparticles inside that are also approved and also, well, especially in the past, uh, were used for biomedical applications. Thank you. There is uh, a question. You <laughs> to the audience from Arancha. Uh, she oh. thanks for your talk, and she asks if it's possible to make orders arrays of the nanoderms, and if so, have you observed any remarkable differences in the magnetic and or optical properties of these arrays? Mm, well, I have to say that uh, we couldn't get a perfect order. I guess that uh, Arancha is thinking is like a perfect self. Uh, assembly. However, in this case, the fact that the, the, you only have partially covered the, the particles, uh, well, to form like a perfect self-assembly 
and let's try to in the particles interact with each other let's say isotropically uh, well i guess that it's it's difficult maybe they can form like a, another type of uh, uh, structures like uh, well, I know if uh, the polar change, but uh, well, we couldn't get that. But I guess that if they do, if you are able to form, like even if they are a small, uh, well, a small change, uh, of course it has a, it will affect the, the properties. And I can imagine it might also be if they are kind of sticking together, if they're in hmm. good. Um, there is another question um, from Mariona. Escoda Torella, um, as she finds it really interesting and wondered um, if the biomolecules are bound only to the gold and if this can be a problem for the stability in, in blood if these nanoparticles are used in blood. Mm, I think it could not be a problem because the bond between the, um, uh, the gold and the cysteine, the thiol groups or the amine groups, is very uh, strong, so I don't expect any desorption of the proteins. So, well, I think that uh, not. And also the key point of uh, this is that uh, you get more cell internalization, so the uh, therapy could be more efficient. Okay, if there's no further questions, I think we will thank you again. Okay, yes, there was a thanks for the answer. Um, thanks for your great talk. And let's move thanks. to the next speaker. Start sharing my screen. Um, and our next speaker is Ilya Sarga from the Institute. Um, Institute the <laughs> Okay, and then I think we can reconvene with the session on time. And it is my pleasure. I, I hope you're all kind of waking up now, so I just make a big wave. Um, <laughs> it is my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, uh, who's um, talking about magnetic phase diagrams and elicited control of reverse modes in ferromagnetic nanotubes. And uh, the talk is given by Oscar Iglesias um, of the University uh, of Barcelona. Please go ahead. Okay, uh, thank you, and uh, Naomi, for the introduction. And uh, today, uh, I would like to, to present this uh, talk on this session on, on novel functionalities. And uh, the talk is going to be based on uh, novel functionalities, I think, uh, of uh, thermagnetic nanotubes. And uh, I will show you um, some results uh, regarding the, the different uh, magnetic uh, configurations that can be achieved in uh, magnetic nanotubes when properly tuning the exchange and the pole interactions in between the, the spins forming the tube. And also uh, show you how this affects the reversal mode of these nanotubes. The results that I'm going to show you are uh, a collaboration over the years with a group of uh, Johan Restrepo and Hernan Salinas in, in Colombia. And I refer to these two recent articles uh, for the results and more details. So first thing uh, is just to, uh, instead of giving an introduction on nanotubes, which would uh, take me kind of a half an hour, uh, uh, and I think that all you know what is a nanotube nanowire, uh, I'll just will only mention how to obtain uh, a nanotube, which is the, the, uh, the object of study of, of what I'm going to talk today. Um, one thing, uh, one way to to get a, a tube is just from a general lattice, uh, like this one in here, or graphene, or whatever. Uh, you can roll the tube following some direction. In our case, we will roll them 
uh, from a square lattice uh, along a diagonal, and then you get this kind of zigzag nanotubes with different layers, um, having different layers with uh, n atoms per layer, and n zeta would be the length, would be characterizing the length of this nanotube. Uh, why zigzag nanotubes? Okay, this would uh, let us, uh, lead us to uh, uh, another topic of the talk, but uh, let me tell you that uh, rolling the tubes in different directions would uh, give uh, rise to different configurations uh, also, right? So the basis of uh, the study uh, are, uh, are here. I'm not going to enter into details, only tell you that these will be results of Monte Carlo simulations on, a, on an optimistic uh, model of the nanotube in which the S is here represent the spins uh, sitting at the lattice uh, nodes. And uh, there will be two competing interactions mainly, uh, the exchange interaction, which is uh, short range, and then the dipole interaction between spins. These spins can be thought of as uh, atomic spins uh, in the sense that you may roll a, a thin film in order to form a continuous thin film in order to form the tube, or you can think that uh, these spins represent giant spins associated to a macromolecule that has been deposited or a nanoparticle that has been deposited on the surface of a, of a cylinder. Important uh, parameter here will be the interaction ratio, uh, gamma, which uh, gives you the strength of that all interaction as compared to J. When we started the, re the reversal modes, well, we'll have to introduce the Zeeman coupling uh, with the magnetic field. And um, in order to study uh, the magnetic configurations, we use uh, linear temperature decrease of, uh, um, from high temperature and also uh, an annealing in order to obtain the ground state configurations of the system. The first thing that we can uh, study is how the magnetization varies as a function of, uh, for a given uh, nanotube radius and length, uh, without varying them, how the um, varying the competition between dipolar and, uh, and exchange interactions, as you do increasing uh, dipole interactions, uh, the magnetization of the tube varies, and you see that uh, uh, when uh, a change dominates, uh, it orders ferromagnetically, and uh, when uh, dipolar interaction dominates, the magnetization becomes zero, and in the middle, you, you see intermediate states with some uh, intermediate magnetization. From the peaks of the susceptibility heat, and, uh, and uh, sorry, from the specific heat peaks and the susceptibility peaks, we, we can see also that there's a critical temperature for ordering, uh, which is supposed to happen in between the paramagnetic and one of these ordered phases here. And uh, you see that this uh, critical, pseudo critical chapter, because here we're dealing with final size effects, uh, varies with the, with, the, uh, with, with the coupling constant gamma. And there are three regions of characteristic variation, which now we will be studying in more detail. In order to characterize, better characterize uh, the, the order parameter associated to these phase transitions, we have found that vorticity instead of magnetization, as is usually employed for other um, studies on skirmions and so on, um, characterizes better what happens when we lower the temperature from uh, high to low temperature. We see that uh, when dipole interaction dominates, the vorticity goes to one, which indicates the formation of vortex states. And uh, when um, the paramagnetic interaction dominates, the dipole interaction is low then uh, the vorticity goes to zero. And in between, again, we see intermediate states, the uh, nature of which uh, we're going to characterize uh, in the following. Um, for this range of uh, inter intermediate values of the uh, coupling parameter, uh, when we look at the magnetization components, we see that for small gamma, where the change dominates, um, the, the spins point along the, the tube direction, uh, whereas for high gamma, the spins have a component uh, which is tangent to the surface with no radial and no axial components, which is uh, typical of a uh, vortex structure. For, however, for intermediate gammas, uh, where the two uh, interactions compete, uh, we, have, uh, we observe a, a progressive reduction of the zeta component and an increase of the azimuthal component, which are mm, now we are going to uh, look into more detail. So it seems that the, that the vortice parameter helps us in order to understand uh, what does the general phase diagram for a given uh, radius and length. 
what we see is that uh, the spins overfire magnetically uh, for low gamma, uh, forming a perfect vortex at higher gamma. But in the middle, we see this kind of illegal uh, structures in which the spins tend to follow the LX uh, uh, in which we have uh, folded the lattice. So in order to better understand this, we can see here what's the angle that the spins form uh, as a function of uh, uh, across the, 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 the tube length as a function of the interaction, uh, dipole interaction parameter. And we see that we go from ferromagnetic states, which have all spins aligned, to uh, spins uh, uh, aligned at 90 degrees here, forming a per uh, complete, uh, perfect vortex. And in between, we see these uh, helical, uh, helicoidal kind of structures characterized by in intermediate uh, values of the angle theta. Then we can also study what happens when we elongate the, the tube, the length dependence, which we see here uh, uh, as a function of, uh, um, uh, as a function of uh, the number of layers of the tube. Uh, for the magnetization and vorticity, what we see is that of small gamma, small gamma values here and here, when it change dominates, there's an abrupt transition from the vortex to the magnetic state. So the helical, helicoidal states cannot be, uh, cannot, uh, uh, are not favored. Whereas for large gamma, dominant dipolar, we see a vortex-like state that dominates at all lengths. Uh, and again, in the middle, we see uh, an intermediate uh, values of gamma. We see that again, helicoidal states form. So uh, picking up all these drugs, we can build uh, phase diagrams for different values of the uh, dipolar coupling. Uh, to exchange a parameter. And uh, um, we are able to determine the different regions, uh, lengths, lengths, and uh, radius of the, of the tubes for which the ferromagnetic vortex and helicoidal intermediate states, metastable states, uh, can be formed. And we see that as we increase the dipolar uh, um, interaction, uh, the vortex are favored, uh, whereas when ferromagnetism dominates this area, extends too much. Uh, wider areas of the phase diagram. And in between, there's an area uh, for all lengths and, uh, and diameters of the tube in which these helicoidal states uh, are stable. These are finite tubes. Here, you, you can see some examples of configurations uh, ranging from uh, uh, pretty uh, narrow tubes, uh, changing the length. You see that there's always a cap of uh, spins that try to form a vortex. There's a ferromagnetic area and, uh, and the, the extension of this cap of uh, vortex states depends on the radius and also on the length of the tube, as if you compare here uh, from here. If the tube becomes very wide, uh, wide diameter, then the vortex is uh, formed completely. In order to better characterize this, we thought of, um, we can uh, see here, for example, the comparison between the calculations, these two lines here, uh, the results of uh, the simulations, and then uh, the, the comparison between different uh, states. Uh, a mixed state, which would be formed by a ferromagnetic uh, uh, in part, and uh, vortices of uh, extension lambda at the ends, which is a theoretical state, trying to describe what uh, happens in the simulations. And, um, and also a state uh, which is characterized by, um, by a quasi-uniform uh, orientation of the magnetization, let's say, all the spins forming an angle theta with respect to the uh, tube length. And what we see here is that um, this uh, kind of uh, mixed state uh, um, description of what happens is a very good description uh, for uh, precisely for the uh, values of gamma close to uh, the, the regions where we see the formation of helicoidal states. So um, it seems that these mixed states are, are a good way to describe uh, the simulations. However, notice here that the differences in energies between the uh, simulated and milling results from the computations and states forming a perfect vortex or these ones is very tiny, which means that in this region, high metastability uh, uh, would allow us to go from an helicoidal state to a vortex state or ferromagnetic state, depending perhaps on the history we submit the sample to. Here, uh, I don't have time to go into uh, on how this um, description of uh, uh, vortex states can be, can be done. It's just a minimization 
process based on, on, on numerics and allows you to study uh, how to uh, predict which is the region in which you would find uh, this metastability of helical uh, state form for any tube length and radius. And now let's switch to the uh, reversal mode dependence on uh, the, the gamma parameter. Now let's take a nanotube, uh, this is channel one, and let's study what happens with the reversal modes along a dear stasis loop. We see that uh, for small gamma, when it change dominates, the, the square loops are, uh, the, the loops are square, which indicates the Korean reversal. And uh, we see that uh, the corrosive field decreases with, uh, when increasing the dipole interactions. For intermediate gamma, for example, here, these red curves, what we observe is that due to the competition of these interactions and due to the, the, the presence of these metastable helical states uh, close to remanence, variation in the inversion modes from run to run uh, occur. And uh, when we are averaging over 30 realizations, we, we obtain these strange loops here. Uh, for higher uh, dominant dipole interactions, the reversal proceeds according to the formation of vortex states uh, that are the ones that form at remnants. And this can be clearly seen here uh, by looking at the evolution of the vorticity uh, with the magnetic field along the stasis routes. So, um, um, in, in order to understand this, uh, um, what happens for this, uh, for this range of uh, gamma parameters in which the electrical states are the, the ground state configurations, we uh, uh, run 100 additional modes, um, runs, simulations, to see, um, to realize that um, depending on the, on the, on the different state uh, with which uh, the simulation started, you can have uh, asterisk loops with, uh, with low coercivity, high coercivity, or two mixing reversal mechanisms at both branches with, uh, an, uh, with a rate that depends on, uh, on the tube length and also on this parameter gamma here. Uh, you see here that on uh, this Q1 mode of low coercivity uh, corresponds uh, to the formation of a vortex uh, at remanence, uh, whereas the high uh, coercivity mode corresponds to the formation of a two um, vortex walls that propagate and confront each other, and this is the reason for the high uh, stability, uh, sorry, for the high coercivity in this mode. So the question is, can we control the reversal mode by changing um, something, uh, changing the conditions at which uh, the starting uh, configuration of the tube uh, before the loop is, uh, is considered? And the answer is yes. And how the, then uh, without that uh, changing the initial configuration of the tube before the stasis loop is, uh, if it's measured, can uh, drive the, the different two modes. If initially we uh, prepare the tube such that um, two vortices are formed with the same clarity, like in this configuration here, and a, a central thermagnetic part is in initiated, as in here, you see that the evolution is following 100% times the low coercive uh, field mode. Whereas if we prepare the, the nanotube as in here with uh, vortices uh, uh, with opposite chirality, then we induce the reversal by the high coercive uh, mode. So we have a, a way to tune uh, high or low coercivity in the same tube by tuning the, the fine tuning the initial condition, especially the chirality of the vortices that are formed at the ends of the tube. This can also uh, be studied for longer tubes, for H20 in this case, and we observe the same phenomenology, although in this case, the Q1 and Q2 modes happens in a different proportions. And, uh, and uh, to make the story short, we see that uh, in this case, uh, for longer tubes, uh, preparing the tubes with the same chirality at the ends, uh, we achieve 100% reversal through the low coercivity and uh, while preparing them in opposite chirality uh, vortices, we achieve uh, the high coercivity uh, reversal mode 100% of the times. So the efficiency of the chirality, chirality tailoring depends on the tube length uh, and even on the number of uh, layers that, that you have. Similar results can be obtained by micromagnet simulations. Of course, I don't have time to show them uh, in this talk, and uh, just uh, to tell you that uh, uh, micromagnetics uh, agrees with the results. Also, and I will leave 
the conclusions for you to read, highlighted in red, the main keywords and messages to take away. Thank you uh, for your attention. And that's all open to questions that you may have. Uh, thank you very much. Um, are there questions? Again, please, if you have questions, write them in the um, um, in the chat. Uh, and maybe, ah, yes, okay, there is a question from Carlos, um, Juan Carlos. Um, in nanometers, what is the diameter of nanotube and nanotube wall thickness considered? Well, here I'm, the, the, uh, unfortunately, we cannot go to realistic diameters when dealing with atomistic uh, simulations because the, the number of uh, entities to be simulated with dipole interactions, you know, it's, uh, they are long range, are difficult to tackle. Uh, you saw typically this, um, um, these tubes would have eight, 16 uh, lattice lengths in diameter and lengths up to 64 lattice uh, parameter lengths. But uh, this can be scaled up using macromagnetic simulations, as I told you. The, all these energies scale can be scaled up uh, as long as you respect the you know, aspect uh, length ratio of, uh, of the tube. So I think this can be extrapolated to longer tubes. And we have a, a second question um, yeah. from Oksana. Yeah, um, sure. If this is not a numerical experiment, how would you prepare tubes with the same mm -hmm. or opposite chirality at the end? I was expecting this uh, question. In fact, this is the big question, right? How, how do we manage uh, to experimental first to synthesize uh, the tubes? I mean, th there's experimental realizations of uh, curved geometries uh, nowadays. So um, I think that rolling up uh, a ferromagnetic layer into a tube shape, of course, not with the thickness of uh, one atom, it's not easy. Um, I, don't, I don't have a proposal, right? <laughs> I mean, I'm sorry, Oxana, I cannot uh, answer this question. I'm just exciting experimentalists uh, to reach this. I mean, maybe um, just if we're able to apply uh, proper magnetic fields or current uh, to the end of the tubes, we can uh, fine tune the, the initial configuration of the tubes uh, one day. I've seen during the sessions of uh, these uh, novel functionalities, we have seen many, many nice uh, experimental achievements uh, along this way. But uh, okay, for now, this is computational experiment. I'm sorry. No, that's, uh, that's okay. I think that has, has to come both ways, theory and experiment. Yeah, yeah. Especially with those questions. Okay, thank you very much um, for the talk. We are perfectly on time to continue yeah. with the next contribution. Um, so I think um, Aranj Traile Rodriguez um, and from the University of Barcelona, and she will present about nanoscale manipulation of magnetic domains by strain induced proximity. Okay, thank you very much. Um, uh, for this introduction, Naomi, and thank you very much for organizing this, uh, this mini colloquium, which uh, uh, has been quite successful. I also have a very good feeling about the poster the session from uh, yesterday. And um, well, so the motivation to, uh, to our work is to uh, manipulate the magnetic uh, properties uh, without the use of a magnetic field. Uh, uh, and this is with the idea of uh, going in general um, for uh, more efficient spintronic uh, devices. So um, uh, this is a collaborative effort between uh, our group at the University of, uh, of Barcelona and the group of Ivan Schuller at the University of California in uh, San Diego and the group of uh, Gabriel Ramirez at uh, Universidad de los Andes in Colombia and uh, Florian Cronas uh, from uh, Bessie Synchrotron. Um, so there are uh, several approaches to control uh, magnetism uh, without the use of magnetic uh, fields in hybrid uh, heterostructures. And one of the uh, most often used is uh, then uh, typically the use of a ferromagnet in combination with other a piezoelectric or a ferroelectric or a multiferroic uh, material. Uh, so meaning uh, using uh, bias voltages uh, to switch on, off or drive uh, domains in general. Um, there are still a few works that exploit uh, the use of materials with a structural uh, phase transition. 
Uh, and this is what uh, we will do here. So uh, what uh, we will show you is that if we use um, a, a substrate that experiences a structural uh, phase uh, transition, then uh, during the transition, the stress uh, created then can be passed uh, to the magnetic material. And if this magnetic material is a reasonable magnetostrictive material, such as uh, nickel, for example, then the nickel can see uh, or can yeah, experience a signature of this uh, phase transition, meaning that the domain pattern can, uh, can change. So the system of choice is uh, nickel on uh, the uh, vanadium oxide, in particular V203. And uh, why would we uh, then choose a vanadium uh, oxide? So the reason is that this family of vanadium oxides, not, not only V203, but V02 and, and others, can experience a structural phase transition in a very narrow uh, temperature range. Uh, so particularly in the case of V203, this is between this uh, low temperature monoclinic going to a high temperature uh, phase, which is rhombohedral. So this transition uh, happens within six, seven degrees, and then implies a volume change of about 1.4%. Uh, so the interest of these materials as well is that uh, there are multiple driving forces uh, that one can use uh, for um, uh, creating this transition. In our case, we will just use temperature, but uh, you could then manipulate it with voltage or current, as well as light or uh, pressure. In fact, one of the interests of this material as well is that concomitant with this uh, structural phase transition is a metal insulating uh, transition. Uh, this means that uh, during the transition, you have a change of several orders of magnitude in the uh, electrical uh, resistivity in the material. We don't exploit this uh, in our work, but uh, I mentioned because this could then be uh, interesting, uh, you know, for, um, you know, photoelectric hybrid materials, for example. So uh, we will be working on, uh, on this type of hydrostructure, so nickel layers deposited on, on V203. So our typical sample would be something like we uh, show you here in this sketch. So we have 10 nanometers of, uh, of nickel. We have a coating layer to avoid uh, oxidation and preserve the, the nickel magnetic properties. And then we have a substrate of 100 nanometers of V203. Um, and then, um, so these samples were grown at, um, at UCSD um, in the group of Ivan Schuller. And, uh, um, so this is uh, the, grown by uh, magnetron sputtering, and the V203 uh, grows in this kind of terraced uh, structure that you see here. So they are defined uh, orientations. Uh, you can clearly see, and then so then they are yeah terraces of uh, typically of the order of uh, several hundred nanometers in length, and then you have voids between them, and then uh, so for example you uh, see here a conductivity map. You can easily see this metal insulating uh, faces that then follow uh, the topography. Um, and what this uh, group, uh, the group of Ivan Schuller, saw a few years back is that when you put a nickel layer on top, then you can experience a, a large en enhancement of the uh, coercivity between the high temperature phase, um, the, the red, uh, uh, this is a small, to a, a, the low temperature phase. So you see this increase of coercivity by 300 percent. Uh, so this is then, uh, it was then back at the time inferred uh, that, uh, of course, then uh, during the transition, uh, this structural phase transition, there would be uh, a significant amount of stress created at the interface uh, with the nickel, and that this would then create an anisotropy field of tens of first step that then would, uh, would be responsible for that. But there was not understanding of the micro uh, structure really of the micro uh, uh, magnetic domains. And this is then the, the aim of our work that we wanted to understand what was going on. Uh, before going into that, then let me just show you a, a bit more in detail that if you from this hysteresis loops uh, plot uh, the, the evolution of this coercivity, then you see from the high temperature phase to the low temperature phase, how this is really growing. I ignore uh, for the moment these arrows and, and numbers. Uh, what is interesting is that here, this uh, temperature around 165 is exactly the temperature at which the uh, transition, the structural transition of E2 of 3 occurs. Um, so this is really a good indication that, of course, then uh, the V203 is driving the, the magnetism here. As I said, our motivation is to understand why uh, the, the coercivity, and we wanted to look at the domains, and this is what I will show you in the following. So um, uh, what we do here is to um, image magnetic domains using XMCD beam as a contrast, uh, uh, magnetic contrast mechanism. So what we do is to collect XMCD images as a function 
fraction of the temperature. So typically our stacks are about uh, 20 images or so. I only show you here uh, four uh, relevant snapshots at four uh, temperatures, the low, uh, low temperature, high temperature, and two temperatures uh, in between across the, uh, the transition. And uh, to understand these images, I first have to say a few words about the experimental uh, protocol so that you can understand what is the color code here. So what we did, uh, let me then go back here, is first, then we, um, at high temperature, we did a field cool uh, with, uh, with uh, this, this magnitude that you see here that is well above the coercive field at the low temperature phase. So once we reach the, the lowest temperature in our experiment, we then apply a counter field. Uh, but this counter field for uh, it's uh, of this magnitude you see here, and it is actually less, as you can see, of the coercivity in the low temperature phase. Uh, this will come uh, later uh, relevant in the discussion. Uh, uh, so what we will then do is when you look at this map, this blue color here means the initially saturated state. Uh, so this is our majority phase. We start with blue. Uh, and then uh, we are, as we warm up, and this is how we collect the cycle, then um, a domain pattern of minority domains in yellow uh, appear. So then the yellow would be in this high temperature phase and the blue would then be the low temperature uh, phase. Uh, um, so what we observe is that we have this initial saturated state which breaks into small domains a V2 uh, exactly happening at the point where the structural phase transition of V2O3 occurs. So there are a few observations to, to be made. The first one I want to make is that the, uh, the length scale uh, of, this, uh, of these domains when we analyze the, the texture is comparable to that of the uh, structural and the metal insulating uh, transition uh, domains. Uh, so they are in the order of width uh, one to 100 nanometers in length could be several hundred nanometers. So it's really pretty comparable. Uh, now, one also uh, observation that one can generally uh, make is that uh, from the low temperature to the high temperature, we observe a, a reorientation of the uh, magnetization. So, um, uh, and now I have to go back to the experimental protocol to understand that. So, if you uh, remember, um, this uh, field is not high enough to overcome the, the coercive field. Huh? So this means that with the, uh, the, the, the counter field that we applied, we cannot fully reverse the magnetization. Huh? But on the other hand, this field then uh, is above the coercive field at a high temperature, which means that as we warm up, then we are uh, progressively uh, counterbalancing this, uh, this effect. And then what we create in general is a rotation of the magnetization between this let's say low temperature phase as we start our stack and the high temperature phase. Now, to understand this a bit better, we have to go to this diagram. It's a bit profuse, but let's for the moment only focus on these lines here. So we have um, that the nickel at the high temperature phase um, has uh, an effective uniaxial and isotropy. Huh? Uh, and in fact, this is then uh, going along this direction in red which then corresponds to this particular cut. Uh, so this is then the direction of these terraces in the V203. Uh, but when we cool down, the nickel then has an effective uniaxial and isotropy in a different uh, uh, direction. Uh, so this is the one that you see in blue. So the, this is an, an effective easy axis because in fact, at the low uh, temperature, there, there are two uh, structural variants that are uh, predominant in the V203 that are then competing. And as a result, we have this effective uniaxial and isotropy. Uh, so because then you have one easy axis at low temperature, another easy axis at high temperature. And on top of this, we are applying a counter field, which is then geometrically halfway between them. It's why that then uh, we go from blue to yellow in this rotation of the magnetization, which effectively is of the order of 35 degrees or so, as I will show in the following. So we, uh, with PIM, with XMCD PIM, we can quantify, uh, in fact, this, um, these uh, canting angles. Uh, and this is what we, uh, we do here. So um, uh, what I plot here in these histograms is for these specific snapshots, the, uh, the, uh, the fraction of uh, domains as a function of the angle. So we do this pixel by pixel. And uh, so we, uh, there are two important statements to make here. One is that uh, if you look at the low temperature phase or high temperature phase, then the distribution is very sharp and centered in a particular value. If you go in the middle of the transition of the V203, uh, then the distribution is broad. 
Uh, so uh, this means that uh, it's already an indication that we have a coexistence of uh, phases, the high temperature and the low temperature phase uh, here. Also from these histograms, you can already see this is at low temperature centered around 60. Uh, it's around 25 centered for the high temperature. There, so there is this reorientation of about 35 uh, degrees or so. So um, um, in order to understand this uh, a bit better, so what we do is to perform some uh, micromagnetic uh, simulations. Huh? So um, the, we use UMF uh, to do that. And uh, our model is very simple, huh? but that uh, captures the, the main uh, features uh, behind the experimental uh, work. So what we do is that we don't uh, simulate, this is the typical nickel slab that we work. So we took uh, a slab of 10 by 10 microns because this corresponds to the typical areas that we investigated with the beam. And then our cell size is uh, 100 nanometers. We put the, the thickness of the experiment. Um, and then, so what we uh, do is to simulate domains as a random distribution of uh, rectangles, roughly uh, 700 by 800 nanometers or so, which emulate the XMCD domain texture. They are random, uh, distributed, but the fraction of initial versus newly formed domains is as in uh, the XMCD images. Then for each temperature, then we set the distribution of low temperature and high temperature and isotropy axis, as I showed in the image, uh, well, in the figure before, mimicking again the distribution in the domain pattern. Then we apply the magnetic field with the same magnitude and with the, um, uh, well, geometry as in the experiment and let the magnetization evolve until the stationary uh, state is reached. So uh, what uh, then we observe is the following. No? So if we go to the bottom, we, this is then this anisotropy domain distribution, again, for these particular four um, uh, temperatures that I show. Uh, this is just to show uh, uh, this distribution of domains, high temperature domains um, or low temperature domains, and then how the magnetization has then stabilized. So again, what we observe is a, a, you know, a resulting uh, mag magnetization that sort of emulates more or less the kind of pattern uh, we uh, observe in the experiments. We can, uh, of course, extract uh, the histograms from these experiments. And again, we reproduce that we have sharp distributions at the high temperature and low temperature, while the distributions are very broad uh, across the transition. Uh, uh, again, a signature no, uh, from the simulations of this coexistence of these two phases uh, imprinted by um, the, the interface with the V2O3. Uh, uh, in this case, the rotation is not as pronounced uh, as in the experiment, but it's, it's more, roughly 20 or 20 something versus 30 something. But here, as you see, then we have then, uh, I mean, our domains are uh, simulated in the shape of rectangles, while our actual experimental domains have uh, different shapes. Uh, if we quantify this, I mean, let's have a look now to all the points, not just to these uh, particular four snapshots, and we uh, plot the average uh, rotation of the magnetization angle as a function of the temperature. This is what we see, this agreement between the experiment and the, uh, and the simulation. Um, we did some statistics. It's not easy because you have a limited number uh, of, of shifts in the synchrotron, but nevertheless, we, uh, we, we checked that, that, that in fact, if we reproduce the experiment, we get the same trend. And, uh, and the one thing that we can also do is that from this uh, delta, um, the, so this canting angle, evaluate the standard deviation. So when we do that, again, around the uh, 165 Kelvin, which is the, uh, the, the, the transition temperature, we find then uh, a peak, no? which is then again a characteristic that the, the highest the dispersion occurs there where this first order phase transition in the V203 occurs. There is a second set of simulations we run. Uh, and this, uh, instead of feeding um, the simulations with the uh, XMCD domain patterns, we use the uh, conductivity domain maps uh, from uh, the group in San Diego and uh, Basso, uh, Basso and Schuller. And then uh, feeding with this, and again, uh, uh, performing uh, in a similar way the simulations, we obtain the magnetization patterns in the uh, top row, as you see in the following. So again, the, the simulations um, mimic that of the experimental V203 conductivity maps. Huh? So uh, this mimics uh, pretty well. And uh, there is a high resemblance between these local patterns that we observe with the nickel magnetization and the conductivity. Um, the differences that we might appreciate with compared to the actual domains that we observe, I mean, we don't observe these nicely terraced domains in our case, but it's because in this case, in, in our case, we have always this competition 
between the nickel, which we would like to grow very large domains, and the, um, uh, and the, uh, the, the interfacial stress created that then, or, or, or the nickel, that, uh, sorry, the, the V2O3, that would then like to grow these uh, small domains fitting the length scale of the um, structural domains. Therefore, uh, our experiment, the domains look a, a little bit different, but general features uh, prevail. Um, a couple of more things just to conclude. Uh, we can also evaluate the uh, correlation lengths uh, from the uh, XMCD pin images. So this is done taking every image in the stack and evaluating um, by means of a radial distribution uh, pair analysis, um, uh, obtain uh, this pair correlation function as a function of the uh, of the length of the of the distance so this would be then for examples of these experimental uh, per correlation functions and now what we can do is to fit to one term uh, exponential each of these functions and from this one term exponential we deduce the domain correlation length important this is not the spin correlation length because we don't have this resolution with the pin uh, the spatial resolution but the domain correlation um, and again, what is important to see is that right in the middle of the transition, 165, then we find this uh, increase in the correlation, a typical feature no, of these uh, first order phase transitions as well. In fact, if we compare this domain correlation length with the structural correlation length uh, obtained previously in V203, we see that they match very well, not only the temperature, but also in the, in the length. Uh, again, uh, here's the order 1.5 uh, microns, the maximum we find in our case about 2.4. And again, the differences uh, between looking at the nickel or looking at the vanadium oxide would be that, again, the nickel has to a tendency by itself to grow in larger domains. Of course, mag magnetostatics also wants to win in some extent. But uh, we see this abrupt rise in the correlation length and it matches well that of the stripes of the structural and also conductivity domains. Uh, finally, then uh, we can also look at um, the, uh, do a spatial, a spatial map of the local transition temperatures. This is what is so shown here. So here the color code is uh, temperature. Uh, and what you can see is that when you look at, um, at the samples, it's not that certain areas have one temperature, uh, a transition temperature, and some other neighboring areas another. No, there is really a mixture all over the place. So uh, there is a broad distribution of local transition temperatures, and this is then, again, another uh, signature of, uh, of this spatial phase uh, coexistence. So uh, with this, I conclude. Then let me just uh, put uh, or highlight uh, take-home messages from here. So first order uh, structural phase transition, such as the one observed in B203, can indeed imprint a magnetic pattern uh, in a nickel layer. This, um, this produces a domain uh, rotation in the nickel, so it does not fully reverse, but it does rotate, and this rotation persists below the uh, structural phase transition. Um, the lateral correlation length of the domains rises abruptly at the transition temperature, and the width really scales that of the transition, and uh, Therefore, then the phase uh, coexistence of nickel and isotropies um, is induced by the stress across the interface with the V203. Let me then just to, to finalize uh, um, acknowledge uh, my collaborators at the uh, group of magnetic nanomaterials at the University of Barcelona. Again, the group of Ivan Schuller in San Diego, uh, Gabriel Ramirez in uh, Colombia, Florian Cronas uh, at BESI, and then our funding agencies. And thank you for your attention. Yeah, thank you for, for this really nice talk. Um, are there questions from the audience? I mean, okay, I have two, a question and a comment and maybe there's another question coming up from the audience then. Um, so just to clarify, it really looks like the sharpness of the magnetic transition or the, what you see in the magnetism is as sharp as the structure transition. Uh, sorry, uh, 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 let me just, sorry, uh, just a moment, because I've lost the, the, the screen somehow. We still see the slide. Ah, you see, okay, well, then, uh, okay, yeah, so, so uh, please repeat again. Uh, so the sharpness of the magnetic transition, or the, the signatures in the magnetism are as sharp as the structure transition as well in temperature, or is there some extra broadening? Yes. 
Ah, uh, no, it's really the, the sharpness is related to, uh, to, uh, to really the structural phase transition. I must say, nevertheless, that uh, I didn't mention explicitly, but you see that we apply a certain field, uh, this counter field. Um, but, and this counter field um, helps the, the process to occur. But uh, we perform the experiment without applying a magnetic field and it occur all the same. The only thing is that if you uh, just let the system evolve by itself, so let's say you initially saturate, uh, cool down, uh, so saturate, cool down in field and then in, uh, warm up by itself, domains form at the nickel, so without you doing anything else. It's just that the domains are small, smaller, and then uh, they are less in, in fraction. And because they are less in fraction, then it's very tedious to do a proper statistical analysis. And therefore, then we apply this counter field in order to make more domains and larger so that it's easier for the analysis. Um, but uh, the transition would happen exactly driven by this. And in fact, one, I mean, evidence or the first evidence before going into modeling or anything that it is driven by the, um, by the V203 is that the domains, when you don't, you don't use any field, they are so small. I mean, this is really not the kind of domains you expect in nickel by, by any means, uh, which are typically uh, tens of uh, microns. There was a comment from Julia Herrero Abios. Um, thank you for the talk. Very interesting and very well explained. <laughs> and I agree. Um, just one comment. I thought it was very brave to have a micromagnetic simulation with 10 by 10 micrometers. It seems very, very large, but at least to me. Um, but <laughs> uh -huh. I, I assume it was a big computer that was used to calculate that. But um, so sorry, I, I uh, ah, it's okay. It's not really relevant anyhow. Ah, okay. <laughs> um, if there are no further questions, I would say um, thank you very much for attending, for listening to the talks. I thank the speakers for their presentations, and um, I wish you all a lovely afternoon and um, a good finishing of the conference this week. So. <laughs> okay, thank you. Are we going to make another picture or not? <laughs> uh, we can try if, if people are willing. I'm fan of pictures. Now we are more than before. <laughs> <laughs>